So today, we've been focusing already on geography in the Bible, right? And there's a good reason, I think, why the authors of the textbook don't go through the geography of the Bible and the geography that's relevant to the Bible in the first chapter. Right? On the one hand, you might have found it very useful. Right? Introduce all those places and names and geography beforehand. On the other hand, you right, would have lost your interest very early on. Uh, we would have talked about it in class and your eyes would have glazed over. And yeah, that's not the way to do things. So we're going to do a little bit of recap and there may be some additional geographical perspectives on things we've talked about. And I'll be interested to hear from you uh, towards the end of the semester how you find uh, the approach of this textbook because it does things more thematically rather than you know, organizing let's see, by the order things that are found in the Bible or even by types of literature. Today we're focusing on geography. Right? And we've actually had geography in the picture from the very beginning. Right? Um, in the stories about the patriarchs, right? There's uh, reference to famines and things that were regular parts of life in this part of the world. When we talk about the origins of the Israelites, we found ourselves talking about Egypt. And one of the things I mentioned is the fact that you didn't have to be in Egypt proper, right, or the heartland of Egypt, in order to be slaves of the Egyptians. You may not be able to see it that well, maybe we should get the lights dimmed a little bit, but if you can see it here, right, what's known as Upper Egypt, which may sound very strange to you, and I won't go into why Upper and Lower Egypt seem like they're the wrong way around. It has to do with the flow of the Nile and things like that. But this is the heartland of Egypt. Right? But Egypt wasn't just, as it were, a, a small nation. Um, it grew and shrank. It was like the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, a territory, a people group that forged an empire. And among the holdings of Egypt, when it was at its height, was the land known as Canaan and later known as Israel and then Judah and Israel. And you can see it here on this map as well. Right? You have a little bit of the history right? going back long before we're talking about the origins of Israel. At its height, it has territorial holdings that include the heartland of Canaan and the heartland of what would become the region where the Israelites and then the people of Judah and Israel dwell. And most of the maps that you'll find online will talk about brief periods, but in fact what we see happening is that Egypt waxes and wanes. And there's an interplay with major empires, which are found off to the north, uh, initially to the uh, northeast and then the northwest, of the region where the Israelites, and the Israelites and Judeans dwell. And so Egypt will be strong, and then it'll be pushed back during a time when it's somewhat weaker by groups like the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the Persians, and the Greeks, and the Romans. And so what happens, do you think, to the people of Judah and Israel? They're caught in the middle. And so one of the reasons why we have these constant stories of conquest is because people were fighting over this region. And on the one hand, there were the major players. But on the other hand, there were also the local players as well. So those who carved out a niche for themselves, right? Or who were the rulers of this or that particular city-state. And we'll see that as well. One of the things that the textbook mentioned about the period of the judges, right? and setting aside the question that we've talked about on another occasion of how the Israelites end up in this region, once we get to the story of the judges, the picture that we have seems to reflect a lack of cohesion, a lack of any kind of unity of organization among the people that would later be known as Israel. And in the textbook it mentioned that these seem to be stories about local rulers, local individuals, <coughs> local leaders, local uh, military captains, or however we want to call them. And the stories are then later woven together into the story of the nation that inherits them. Right? When they're referred to as judges, that doesn't mean right. Um, presumably, if you've ever read the story of Samson, who's probably the most famous of the judges, um, you don't picture him as you know, the white wig and the robes and the, that kind of judge, right? You know. He's, like all the rest of them, somebody who 
judges in the sense of having oversight and you know when somebody was a leader of a nation, you know, that's who you went to with a really, really difficult problem. More of a military leader. And if you look at this map, what you'll see is that the judges and the activity that they engage in is very, very <coughs> localized geographically. Right? And so even once they're woven together into a story that tells the story and or of the judges as part of the history of the nations of Israel and Judah, it's not telling a story of national unity. Right? It's telling localized stories that flow into that later stream. As we move on right, from the period of the judges, right, you see the rise of people like Saul and David. You'll find maps online that reflect uh, what may be exaggerated language in the Bible regarding the extent of some of their kingdoms. Uh, but in their heyday, some of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah seem to have stretched quite far. But really, it's talking about you know essentially you know, holding sway over other peoples who still have an existence of their own, just as the people of Judah and Israel and the tribes of Israel are themselves incorporated into other empires. And so, Israel under King David, you've got uh, this map suggesting that. For the first time, there's rule over the entirety of that region that's inhabited by people who call themselves Israelites under a single king. You then have Solomon, David's son, who builds the temple. And the story in the Bible says that when Solomon's reign ends, his son Rehoboam, right, and this is one of the stories mentioned with the euphemism, right? Um, is asked to lighten the load of the people. Don't tax us so hard. Don't work us so hard in all these building projects. And we'll serve you like we served your father, but willingly. And he says that his little finger is bigger than his father's thigh. Uh, it's been suggested that thigh is not really what he was referring to. There. Uh, I'll leave the rest of it to your imagination. But what we see after that period is a split of what is thought of as the United Kingdom, right? Not the United Kingdom. <coughs> nation or territory, but the United Kingdom of Israel into a northern kingdom which retains the name Israel and a southern kingdom which is referred to as Judah. And this is going to be important throughout the rest of the biblical tradition, not least because the Bible as we have it is the Bible of Judaism, right? When we're talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish scriptures. And so one thing we're going to talk about today is what happens to the people who dwelled in that northern area. Where does this ideal of a united kingdom of Israel come from? Why is it such a powerful idea in the literature of the Bible, given that, as a historical reality, it's fairly short-lived? And so that, too, is one of the things that we'll talk about. And that's something which is relevant to understanding the New Testament as well, because the idea of the ingathering of the tribes, their union together under a king who's descended from David, things that were part of Jewish messianic expectations, uh, are also significant in the New Testament. One of the terms that sometimes gets used for biblical history uh, is salvation history. And it's a useful term in as much as it perhaps distinguishes between the kind of history we sometimes at least try to write, uh, trying to get all the facts and do justice to things as impartially as possible. And a story that ancient Israelite authors told or stories that ancient Israelite authors told, where really what they're concerned with is saying, this is what God was doing in our history, right? So it's a theological interpretation of history. You'll remember me mentioning King Omri, so I won't go through this in too much detail. Uh, the Moabite stone, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment, mentions Omri, right? Significant king from a secular perspective, builds a new capital, right? extends the geographical stretch of Israel. The Bible isn't as interested in it. Right? And you've seen on some of the maps the regions of Moab, right? There are times when Moab is not ruled over by the people of Israel, but manages to rule over them. Right? So there are local squabbles, there are national squabbles, and understanding these things is 
a key element in making sense of the biblical narrative. And understanding why the kings of Judah and Israel often seem so stressed. You've got local conflict, you've got uh, regional conflict, you've got international conflict, if you want to call it that. Although in this period, there's nothing like the modern nation state, right? With very, very clearly defined borders that remain fixed over long periods of time. There's the Moabite stone from the Louvre. During the period that we're focused on, right, talking about exile, in fact, we need to use exiles in the plural. The first major player to the north of Israel and Judah are the Assyrians. And the Assyrian Empire encompasses you know, places like what we know of as uh, Iraq, right? Um, what in ancient terms usually refer to as the Near East. Right? It all depends on you know, who's talking about it from what perspective. Right? Um, if you were in China, you'd be talking about the Far West, probably. Right? Uh, all these geographical terms are relative. But what you should note is that at their height, right, the empire of the Assyrians incorporates Israel and Judah and even Egypt. And then in a later time, when Assyria wanes, Egypt makes a comeback. And then the Babylonians take over from the Assyrians, encompass their empire, stretch back, and fight against Egypt as well. And so regularly, the kings of Israel and Judah are caught in the middle. And uh, Hebrew Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann has a great phrase for the game, if you want to call it that, the, the kings in this region had to play. Um, he describes it as international roulette. And on the one hand, I think he's thinking of a roulette wheel where you know you spin and you've got the two options, and you're just hoping that when it stops, it's the one that you pick, right? Because really, it's a bit like that. You've got Egypt, the persistent neighbor and regular dominating power in the south. You have these kingdoms that wax and wane in the north. If you pick right and say, okay, I'm going to throw in my lot with Egypt and pay them tribute, right? Because you can't afford to pay tribute to everyone. You say, I'm going to be faithful to Egypt. If Assyria or Babylon or wherever it is in the north ends up in control, what do you think happens to you and your descendants? Off the throne, possibly killed, people carried off in exile as punishment. If you choose right, then you might live to persist. <coughs> Throughout most of its history, the people of Israel, the people of Israel and Judah, when they're separate nations, are part of larger empires. And one mistaken impression that people sometimes get reading the Bible without a clear knowledge of the geography and a clear knowledge of the history is that when you have exiles carried off to Babylon, or when you have exiles carried off to Syria from the northern kingdom, what's happening is that in that time, for the first time, the Assyrians or the Babylonians are invading and in the process, they're conquering these people and they're carrying things off. And that's not at all what happened. Assyria, Babylon, a bit later, come to be the dominant power in the region, or they're becoming the dominant power in the region. Right? And so the kings who reign in places like Jude, uh, Jerusalem and Samaria pay tribute to whoever's the dominant power. And then they see Egypt seeming to make a comeback and demanding tribute. And so they have to choose, do I go with Assyria, do I go with Egypt? Do I go with Babylon, do I go with Egypt? And when they choose wrongly, or when they choose incorrectly, right, there's a sense in which it's hard to imagine how any of the kings of these regions could have known, right, had the foresight to them. If they don't pay tribute, then troops are sent in, and cities are devastated, and it's punishment inflicted for withholding tribute. Right? It's not the first arrival of these empires in this region. Right? In the case of Assyria, right, once we get to this time period, right, so the, the eighth century, the period when the earliest of the prophets who have books named after them, people like Isaiah, Amos, Micah, Hosea, it's during this period, in the eighth century BC, that we also start to really get lots of useful data from other sources. And so 
we have Assyrian sources that give us information about events that we find mentioned in the Bible. And so after the dynasty of Omri comes to an end, right, King Jehu takes over, you might think, well, this is a period of Israel's independence. But we actually have reliefs, right, pictures of, you know, carpet stone of King Jehu bowing before the Assyrian ruler <coughs> Shalmaneser. And so they had a, re a, a relative independence in the sense that a king was allowed to rule over them of their own choosing or of their own determination, right, by force or by whatever means, if they paid tribute to the empire. And so Israel and Judah were vassal kingdoms. That's what you call them. Right? You were allowed to have a king on the throne rather than simply be incorporated as a province of an empire with a governor appointed from you know, the imperial power if you paid tribute and if you remained loyal. We have inscriptions by uh, Sargon II, king of Assyria. Uh, I added there right, because of all the looting during the Iraq war. Um, there are lots of things that have gone missing from the Baghdad Museum. Some of them are relevant to biblical studies. We have reliefs of the siege of Lachish, which is um, one of the cities that the Assyrians uh, took when they besieged uh, Judah, right, when you have the Assyrians expressing their dominance when the kingdoms of Israel and Judah don't pay tribute. Right, there's what the end of the looks like. Um, this, I think it's a replica, but you can see this in the Israel Museum um, if you ever decide to go to Jerusalem. And so what we see in this period is that right, both kingdoms withhold tribute from Assyria. And we're going to, when we talk about the prophets who lived in this period, we'll talk more about the significance of some of these events. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. To the Babylonian Empire. So, during the time when Assyria is dominant, as a result of not paying tribute, the inhabitants of the northern kingdom, known as Israel, are carried off into exile. During the time of Babylonian dominance, right, for the same basic reasons, the people of Judah and Jerusalem are carried off into exile. And it's as a result of these events that key institutions, which we'll talk about uh, more on another occasion, come into existence. Things like the synagogue. You have this need to establish centers for local communities of Jews, of, or Judeans, however you want to refer to them, who don't live in this region anymore. Right? And so as a result of the exile, we have certain key events happening uh, that relate to not just Jewish institutions that may be familiar, which you haven't encountered in the biblical literature up until this point, but also things like the editing and publication, if we can use that term, right? it doesn't involve printing presses or anything like that. but the production in the form which we now have them of Jewish literature, Jewish scriptures. What happens to the people of the Northern Kingdom? When did the Samaritans disappear? Because <coughs> they come to be referred to later on as Samaritans, right? Uh, as that region gets referred to as Samaria after its capital. Right? But we're talking about the region where the northern kingdom of Israel is. And what you've given is a very good answer by being silent because they don't vanish. Right? And I'll show you some pictures. They're still around today. In the period prior to the Babylonian exile, the Hebrew language was written in a different script. Right? We have inscriptions from that period. And so the square script that you're familiar with is actually the script that's used by, you know, it's, it originates from uh, Aramaic, used by the Babylonians. The earlier Hebrew alphabet, much closer to the Phoenician alphabet, right, developed in uh, place in northern Canaan. Aramaic 
is the language which provides the alphabet that you probably think of as the Hebrew alphabet. It's borrowed during the time of the Babylonian exile. If we ask about the broader picture, there's another writing system that's This is the alphabet that comes to be used by the Samaritans, and there's a page from the Samaritan Bible, uh, which provides interesting uh, textual evidence for what we know as the Hebrew Bible. It used to be that things like this might not be widely known. Nowadays, if you wonder what happened to the Samaritans, are they still around? You Google them, you find out that the Samaritans have a web page. And it's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, the Samaritans have a web page. These are some older photos uh, from a few years ago. The Samaritans have their own traditions. They have a Pentateuch, right, or Torah, which basically is the same as that found in Judaism. They don't accept the other writings, and they have their own tradition, not just and their own stories, not just of how they were carried off in exile, but about returning from exile. And whereas the Jews in Jer uh, Jerusalem had a temple which, after it was destroyed and when it wasn't rebuilt, they ceased to offer sacrifice there, the Samaritans had a temple on Mount Gerizim, and today they still celebrate the Passover there. And they celebrate it using animal sacrifice. And so these pictures are great not only because they give you a sense of the fact that this tradition still continues down to the present day, but also what's involved in animal sacrifice. When you think of worship, you probably don't think of something that looks like this, with the blood and the gore and stuff, and the roasting offal and all kinds of things like that. And so. The Samaritans continue to exist and have their national identity. Right? They have traditions of priests and priestly families. And they gather and worship right, for events like, like the Passover, right, in a place where they've done so for a very long time, in the region that they traditionally inhabited. And so even though when we're talking about the Jewish scriptures or the Christian Old Testament, we're talking about texts that are connected with Judah, and so the history of the southern kingdom. And so we've got a narrowing down of our focus geographically, right, on who's part of that. There's a larger story. And the continued existence of the Samaritans becomes important in the New Testament as well, right? Because there's this story about the Good Samaritan. If you ask people what they know about the Samaritans, they know that there was at least one good one, but they may not know anything else about the Samaritans sometimes if you ask them. By the time of the first century, right, we have competing temples, right? and we have competing national identity. Right? We have this struggle between them. And so there's a lot of animosity, which is part of the important background for this story. Um, in those previous pictures, I just saw all males there. Were, are women not allowed to, to um, go do that? Or is that, just a, is that just a coincidence that it was just all males? That's a good question. Um, let me take a look. Uh, I think that in this tradition, you have men getting the front row of seats. Um, there are definitely some women who are present as well. Uh, but you have a tradition of male priests, right, without female priests. Um, so you can see some women in the background, um, but you have male involved in the priestly activities. Um, so, yeah, that tradition of patriarchy is um, noticeable in the photo. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? <coughs> Let me just say a little bit then about the Good Samaritan, and we can come back to some more things next time if there's interest. What's the point of the story? How many are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan? At least vaguely. It's important to know about geography and politics and things like the, those things that we're focusing on today in order to understand a story like this. If we go back even to the period before we have a united kingdom under David, we have stories about tribes, and those tribes don't always get along, and they don't always agree on who's going to dominate. And they certainly don't agree, when it comes to the northern tribe, that the southern kingdom of Judah, or the southern tribe of Judah, is going to be providing the king from now on and be the dominant player. Right? And so we're dealing with geographical differences, right? the, the highlands versus the, uh, the Judean desert and the lands on the edge of it. 
that reflect different traditions that are reflected in the Bible and contribute to the inner tension. When we get to the first century, right, Jews and Samaritans regularly don't get along, there are all these tensions. Jesus starts by telling a joke, sort of. Right? That's probably the closest analogy. If you've got a priest, a Levite, and somebody else walk into a bar, right, you know you're in the terrain of a joke. right? When Jesus starts telling a story about a priest and a Levite, or a Levite's another sort of functionary, uh, below the priest, but part of the same tribe. There's a certain expectation, right? just as if you've got two people you introduce when you're telling a joke. The third one, you know, you expect to be the hero of the story, right? or it turns out well for him, or he's the butt of the joke, one or the other. The story could have gone either way. Who would expect to be the third person? What happens when the third person turns in the story turns out to be a Samaritan? And what's the point that's being made by this story? You could hear it and just say, oh, it's about helping people. And that's there, but there's more to it than that. You've got a man who's traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Right? It's a long road. Uh, it was a dangerous road in this period. They rob him. They leave him half dead, which is like mostly dead, if you know the princess bride. Right? And they rob him even of his clothes. Do you normally steal someone's clothes? Why is that significant? Well, clothing is one of the ways that you tell Who's part of your own group? Right? People, different nations, different uh, religious groups wore different clothing. And so this guy has been robbed of the markers that might tell you, oh, he's one of my own, I should help him or not. And then you have individuals who pass, the priest and the Levite, probably concerned, you know, because he looks like he might be dead, about ritual impurity and right? not being able to carry out the priestly function. Most hearers of the story are probably thinking, okay, and then a, an ordinary Jewish person is going to be the hero, and he's not going to care about the purity issues, and he's going to help him, right? And then Jesus introduces a Samaritan, part of this hated group, who comes to the guy's rescue. And so Jesus is challenging stereotypes and challenging bigotry, racism, and ethnic, you know, ethnocentrism. Right? If you imagine a story told in a Christian church nowadays in which you have, let's say you have a uh, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, and then, I don't know, let's have a Muslim imam or someone like that be the third person. Um, and people who are thinking it's a joke at the expense of priests or clergy or something like that, are suddenly like, oh, hang on, this is, you know, this is making me a little bit uncomfortable where this is going. It's a story that says things about helping others, and it broadens out the question of who is a neighbor, right? To whom is, do you have a responsibility in obeying that law that says love your neighbor, right? Is it somebody of your own people? Jesus' approach in the story is, put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you would want to be helped, then help them. And so there's a point about you know, Jesus' ethical principle, the golden rule. But there's also a principle about bigotry and racism that's also part of that story. And if we don't understand the geographical and political background to it, we miss some of the overtones which give the story its force. But we're out of time for today, and so I'm going to end there.